Hello, I'm Jane Fuller, co-director of the Centre for the Study of Financial Innovation. And as some of uh, you previous watchers may know, um, uh, accounting standards is one of my favourite subjects. And if you combine that with uh, the hot topic of today, which is sustainable finance, um, you get the question of should there not be a set of ideally global sustainability accounting standards? Um, and so I'm delighted to have um, pulled together three real experts on the subject, um, including uh, one, um, Janine Gilo from the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board in the US, who is actually setting uh, sustainability standards, um, but also uh, uh, Veronica Poole, who's global IFRS and corporate reporting leader at Deloitte and has a hand has had a hand in the virtually every steering group on this subject over the past few years. Um, and David Pitt, Pitt Watson, um, who's got a long background in responsible investing. Um, he's be also been a non-executive director at KPMG. Um, and he's done a lot of work on uh, whether or not existing financial reporting standards um, are adequate to deal with sustainability and where they aren't, of course, um, what we should be doing about them, which is the subject of today's discussion. So I'm going to ask David, as a representative of users of accounts, um, to kick off to tell us, uh, you know, why everybody should be bothered about this subject, particularly those who rely on corporate information. Thanks ever so much, Jane. Yeah, and look, I, I think there are there are two things, two different buckets that we might think of here. One is, as you say, the accounting standards as they exist right now. And as you know, we have two global reporting standards, the International Financial Reporting Standards, IFRS, and the US Generally Accepted Accounting uh, 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 Principle, US GAAP, um, which are established by the IESB and uh, the FASB in the United States. And they're established and they're mandated and they're audited. So they're already there, but actually historically, they have turned an absolutely blind eye to the challenge of uh, climate and sustainability. So it, it until very recently would be quite normal to discover that there was an oil company valuing a new oil well that they'd discovered as though they were getting oil out of the ground in 2050 at $80 a barrel, and it was terribly profitable to, to, to do this. Now look, this stuff on the existing accounting standards, it is beginning to change. It has changed as a result of a set of guidance from the IESB, and I'm hoping that we'll get a similar thing from the, from the FASB and from the, from the United States. And it is essential that it does, because otherwise the incentives that we're setting for companies is to invest in what we would call stranded assets. That is assets whose value cannot be supported in a sustainable world. And since we want a sustainable world, we shouldn't be overvaluing those assets. So that's one thing, it's about the existing accounting standards and a very, very important thing that we're working on those. There's then a second thing, which is that's not all the information that you need about climate and certainly not about human rights or worker rights or all the other things that we want to know about companies. And therefore there have been many, many attempts to think about, look, what are the other things that we need to know about if investors are to play their role in investing well and in uh, using their stewardship powers appropriately to create sustainable companies. And we have over the years developed, to be honest, a bit of an alphabet soup of different people who were looking at how it is that you go about doing this. So there's the SASB, there's the IIRC, of which I was a member of its council. There's the CDP, there's the GRI, there's the CDSB, there's the TCFD, and there's even a taxonomy that's coming out of Europe, um, which is you know, kind of confusing. And it's confusing for investors. It's also confusing for companies. What is it that I'm supposed to report? And therefore there is an initiative, which I think is a really important one. Um, which is to say, look, can we have a minimum standards for the narrative report that goes with the accounting report 
um, that is presented to uh, uh, investors every year. To do that is not straightforward because, first of all, you need to herd all these various different cats that have been doing very good things in terms of trying to uh, 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 push forward uh, uh, sustainability. Uh, and then you want them mandated and then you want them audited. And there's a suggestion from the IESB, the International Accounting Standards Board, that they could have a sustainability standards board that would perhaps cover all of the world or perhaps just the ISB countries, I'm not quite sure. And, and I'm, at that stage, it, it becomes quite complicated, but absolutely necessary that we pull things together. And, and to do that, uh, the person who's really leading the charge on this is of course uh, Janine, who I think you're going to <laughs> introduce next, who has been the chief executive of the SASB now merged uh, with the IRC, which she uh, uh, is now is now leading. But if we did this right, we'd end up with two things. One is, let's start declaring our profits and our, and our solvency on the basis of accounting standards that recognise that we want a sustainable world out there, not that are made on the basis that we can forget about climate change. And then two, let's have a report on climate and on all the other things that investors need to know about the sustainability of the companies that they're investing in so that they can invest wisely and, and steward wisely and getting some minimum standard on that that can be mandated and ideally audited. And that's the, that's the second task. Yeah, thank you, Dave. Just a, a couple of questions. One is, um, actually, if um, companies took materiality seriously, instead of saying it's 5% of, you know, even worse, adjusted pre-tax profits, um, then things like stranded assets or anything that's going to affect the value, values on their balance sheet, uh, should be reported on. Um, and that's exactly right. And actually, Jane, this, this issue of materiality, it's such a good question because, you know, one of the criteria for materiality is that your investors want to know about it. Mm. Well, for good the, the share price. Really, really, really want to know yeah. about climate. There are investor groups coming out of your ears screaming that we want to know about climate. So it's mm. clearly material and needs to be included. And that is what the IASB standard now says. By the way, the investor groups are also saying that the IASB standard says, you need to take climate into account. You need to show your assumptions where they're material. And the investor groups are saying, when we see those assumptions, we want them to be sustainable assumptions. If we do that, of course, then we're calculating profits in a way that is really quite sensible because it's sustainable and companies can continue with that. And then all the other things about their future plans, we would expect to see in the front end of the report, maybe under TCFD or uh, under some other uh, a, a guidance structure like that. But materiality, as you say, is absolutely critical. And it's clear if materiality is about what the investors need to know, gosh, you, you can be in no doubt that investors are interested in climate. Yeah, and actually, this is what we, um, perhaps a good segue to Janine, because it's all in principle. It's easy to say this stuff that this stuff is material, but of course, um, if it's difficult to measure um, and difficult to put a meaningful number, um, particularly into the financial statements, um, then you know you can say it's good in principle, but in practice, it's all too difficult. So, Janine, perhaps you talk a bit about uh, both about this uh, wonderful project, put these two organisations together, but also just about that nitty gritty issue. Yeah, so, so David put that really well. So if we think about this, there's this concept of materiality that's relevant to the financial statements, balance sheet, income statement, footnotes. Um, and, and that's the way people have historically thought about financial disclosure. When we launched SASB, we're trying to be clear that the concept of materiality is relevant to enterprise value. So the valuation of the enterprise, which is a broader concept. And if you go back and if you look at data on the changing nature of corporate valuations since the mid seventies, what you'll see is that corporate valuations, market valuations are increasingly driven by intangibles. And so in a world where investors are trying to make decisions about how do we evaluate these companies, the traditional financial statements play a smaller and smaller role in the concept of what's driving corporate valuation. So the way we talk about this is investors need a broader information set and they need information about performance 
on the sustainability issues that are driving long-term enterprise value. And those are human capital issues, there are environmental issues, there are social capital issues, but investors need performance information around how effectively companies are managing those issues. And those are related, and at the end of the day, comparable, consistent, reliable information. Now, if we go back to accounting standards, what accounting standards did is they created a common language for companies to talk about financial performance with their investors. And we take accounting standards for granted, but they haven't existed from time immemorial. <laughs> accounting standards were ultimately a creation of the market. And so when SASB was launched, the idea was very much mimic the process of accounting standards, the discipline around creating accounting standards, and see if we could create common standards for companies and investors to talk about performance on the sustainability issues that are relevant to long-term enterprise value. So that's a little bit about SASB and the role that we play. Now, we're merging with IIRC, the International Integrated Reporting Council. And the reason for that is that IIRC came from very similar conceptual roots, which is how can companies disclose how they're managing multiple forms of capital to deliver value and create value over the long term? The other very important thing about integrated reporting is it's not just about reporting, it's actually also about integrated thinking, because the goal was not just to think about external reporting, it was to think about how corporate governance and management decision making needed to change in a, in a complex world where there are multiple drivers of enterprise value. So in some ways, um, the IIRC and SASB merger is a, is a match made in heaven because what we have is the integrated reporting framework with a top-down principles-based framework talking about how companies can use multiple forms of capital to drive value and integrate that thinking into their governance and management processes. And then SASB with a more bottom-up um, standards-based approach with specific metrics that companies can use in an integrated report. So the two merge together very nicely and both of them in combined, IR and SASB combined, are that next evolution that David's talking about. Start with the financial statements. Are the financial statements right? And that's a lot of the work around valuation of stranded assets. Are the financial statements right? And then there's another layer which is what, of this, what is this broader information set that, that, that's not currently captured by the financial statements, but is still really important for best investors to understand, to understand prospects for long-term value. Um, so what's really exciting right now, and I will um, transition this to Veronica in a sec, is this idea, which was kind of a, you know, I want to say almost radical idea, even 10 years ago, when both SASB and IR were launched 10 years ago. Um, so we've done, I think both integrated reporting and SASB in the last 10 years have done really groundbreaking work. But, but the thinking at that time was kind, of, was kind of new. And that in only 10 years, we're now at a point where a couple of ideas are mainstream. One, that sustainability issues drive value, risk and return. Two, that investors need a broader information set to um, evaluate value creation prospects. And three, that this should be the realm of accounting, traditional accounting standard setters and securities market regulators, um, that that conversation has evolved this fast in a decade um, is amazing to me. Um, and a huge credit goes to Veronica, who is about to um, also issue a few remarks because she has been one of the leaders in helping to uh, really drive this conversation among the accounting profession and the accounting standard setters. But I think it's been, it's been a um, real coalescing of investor views moving rapidly corporate views moving rapidly, the accounting profession moving rapidly, and now regulators coming to the table 
Um, and I think uh, global standards for sustainability disclosure are now within reach. So I'll stop right there, Jane. Yeah, there's just, a, just, just one or two things. Um, I just wanted to clarify um, the audience for SASB, IIRC, and the new Value Reporting Foundation, rather splendidly named, is still investors, isn't it? It's still providers of capital, because I think one of the uh, elephant traps in this field is as soon as you start writing standards for Greenpeace, you're going to go mad, aren't you, if you're thinking about enterprise value? I mean, that's well, not some overlap, but... The audience is providers of financial capital. So that that picks up, you know, traditional bank lenders too. So creditors, lenders, uh, investors, providers of financial capital. And the reason we do that is exactly your point. We think that setting standards and running a standard setting process requires a very clear understanding of your target audience and the use case of that audience because standard setting is always governed by a conceptual framework generally looking at is the information relevant and is the information decision useful mm -hmm. and the only way you can make that relevance and decision useful decision is if you understand who your target audience is and how they're using the information mm -hmm. now one of the things we've really tried to do with all of our work over the last couple of years on harmonization is make clear that Providers of financial capital are not the only users of this information. NGOs, employees, customers, all, there are many, many stakeholders who use this information. Uh, they also require information. They may also require standard setting processes. And so we often talk about a, a system of standards as opposed to a single set of standards. And the reason we talk about this idea of a system is because if you're setting standards, you need to design things that meet the needs of your users and setting one set to meet the needs of all users, we think is 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 not really feasible, but it is feasible to have a system that, oh, excuse me, operates with a common architecture, tries to use common metrics to make this as easy as possible for companies. Um, we'll, we'll come back to one or two of the other nitty gritties because of your you've had more as you said about your bottom up sectoral approach but I, I want to bring in um, Veronica to, to, to um, update us on what's happening and um, perhaps talk a little bit more about how the alphabet soup is going to miraculously fall into place. Thanks Jane. It's not a small ask because so much has happened in the world of sustainability reporting. In fact I quote my countryman when he said that there are decades where nothing happens and then there are weeks where decades happen. And that's what we are seeing now, very much driven by this unprecedented move by investors towards the use of climate and other ESG information in their investment decisions. So let me try and give a whistle stop tour of the developments before I try and show us to how they uh, glue all together in my view. So let's unwind the clock just a few months back to last September when the IFRS Foundation launched its consultation on sustainability reporting. And in due course, they received nearly 600 responses. They proposed to set up a new Sustainability Standards Board, SSB, to sit alongside ISB. So around the same time, the leading sustainability standard setters and frameworks that does include SASB, um, this has become known as the Group of Five, issued what has become widely quoted as a statement of intent to work together and together with the IFRSF and IOSCO to achieve a comprehensive corporate reporting system. In December, that group issued a prototype climate standard. It was based on CCFD recommendations and showed how the different frameworks and standards could form the basis of a global climate standard. It was very much intended to give the IFRSF a running start when they start writing their global sustainability standards. And I'm very much honored and privileged to have facilitated that work together with World Economic Forum and the Impact Management Project. I'm also now delighted to see that in its latest statement, the IFRSF has now confirmed that it will use this as a potential basis for the development of their sustainability standards going forward. You may also be familiar 
uh, with the web IBC project to measure stakeholder capitalism. So that project recommended 21 cross industry metrics that would cover the pillars of principles of governance, planet, people, prosperity. And this put an important stake in the ground that business also cares about transparency on ESG issues and that it really wants to be part of the global solution. So last month, the IFRSF set out the direction of travel and confirmed that it is on track to announce a new SSB in time for COP26. IOSCO released a statement of support and said that they are ready to play the same role for sustainability standards as they did for IFRSF for IFRS 20 years ago. In Europe, we have recently seen the publication of the EFRAC task force report looking at the potential European standards. In the US, under the new administration, we have seen real acceleration on this agenda with some significant statements made by the Fed and the SEC, including that latest consultation on climate disclosures. So how does it all fit together? And can all these interested parties work towards the same goal? Well, what we do know is that the IFRSF SSB will focus on standards that address enterprise value creation. That basically means impact of sustainability on the company over time. Well, enterprise value and in fact, financial materiality are often viewed as very narrow, but this is not the case. Focusing on value creation over the longer term must take a wider view because in the longer term, enterprise value is interdependent with value creation for society and the environment. And on issues such as climate change, well, it is frankly difficult to see what company impacts would not be relevant to enterprise value creation. So that's the first element of the jigsaw. The next element is the fact that the new SSB will start with climate, but it will not be a climate only board. It is well recognized that climate change affects and is related to a broad range of ESG topics and how companies respond to those topics affect their reputation, ability to attract financial capital, ability to attract customers, employees. And it is good to see that the IFRSF confirmed that the SSB will prioritize climate, but will proceed without delay to other sustainability topics. That's the second piece. The third piece is the speed. IFRSF is moving at pace. To give themselves a running start, they have set up a working group that includes the members of the group of five that are focused on enterprise value creation. So this is your SASB, CDC, CDSB, and IRC. TCFD, WEF, and the ISB will join them at the table, and the work will be observed by IOSCO. So this group will do technical work. It will build on the climate prototypes that was developed by the group of five, and it will also review how the technical expertise and content of these organizations might potentially be transitioned to the new SSB with a view to facilitate that consolidation and reducing fragmentation. So in terms of time, 2022 is starting to look realistic. Mm. But what's critical here is that that move by FRSF gives us a unique opportunity to coalesce around that one set of global standards and put an end to this alphabet soup that David was talking about. The new standards can create a global baseline that jurisdictions can adopt around the world like, like they do with IFRS. And this is often referred as a building blocks approach that involves taking that first block from the SSB and then adding to it. And this is how jurisdictions like Europe who have got a higher ambition and who want companies to report on broader impacts to top up can top up the SSB standards and they can meet their own specific priorities as a result. So in Europe, that would be the priorities set out within the sustainable finance taxonomy or the NFRD. So, and yeah. then that is how we then start gluing everything together. And that how the different pieces of the jigsaw start giving us that picture. Hopefully, towards the end of this year, at COP26, we start actually getting a good understanding how it all fits together. So um, uh, you've also actually um, inevitably set out some of the alphabet soup. So I suppose, um, bearing in mind that we're starting off with um, a lot of different initiatives already, 
Um, and it's from what you've just said, it sounds as though there's been, there's enough common points within all those initiatives for quite, quite quickly to say, well, you know, here are the, um, you know, here are the common points. That's the first thing. I suppose the, the um, I'm, my heart slightly sinks um, at the idea of um, it being your enthusiasm for gold plating, which is effectively what, um, so it's going to be very much like the sort of altered view, old EU pattern it's going to be minimum standards isn't it and then you, as you've said lots of other you know other jurisdictions may add to it um but fi finally I'm you in in even though you mentioned many organizations um you didn't specifically say something, something like say the UN sustainable development goals or GRI and those and that's where you start to think about the other audiences which leads us into the complication so Sorry, that's inviting you to, to sort of set, have a long answer. I would sort of urge you to <laughs> just tackle some of that and then uh, well, I'll open it up. Yeah, so this is very, very interesting because obviously impact reporting, and if you look at Europe in particular, you know, Europe wants this double materiality. It wants not only um, to understand and companies to report on how ESG factors affect the company, but also how company impacts broader society, planet, people, economy at large. And so it is fascinating, therefore, to as see- if, As if there's a dichotomy. So they, when I, what I makes me a bit nervous about the double materiality is it's, it's actually uh, crystallizing. In fact, there's a dichotomy that, that, so that these don't overlap in a sort of enterprise value creation, you know, they not they don't entirely overlap, but this goes to the core of the um, nested and dynamic materiality, which is the concept that the standard set is talk about. So it is broadest lens. There are various sustainability factors that impacts of a company on us, on the world at large. So the broader impacts, if I may say, then in the middle, you would have some of those now internalizing themselves and becoming enterprise value relevant. And then as they internalize themselves further, they become financially recognized in the amounts in the financial statements. And that's what the standard set is referred to as the nested materiality. It's dynamic because obviously these issues travel very fast as we have seen with COVID, as we're seeing with climate. So if you look at something like GHG emissions, you know, so you can actually start um, you know, a few years back when we thought about GHG emissions as a potentially relevant issue to understand company impacts. But we very quickly recognize that actually, you know, some of these become enterprise value relevant, they internalize themselves. And now, of course, what we see is that a lot of these GHG emissions translate into how the customer relates to a company, uh, whether the product is viable, what the price for the product may be in the future and therefore they're already in the cash flow projections that underpin the numbers in the financial statements and that's what's known as that sort of dynamic materiality so csg issues travel across the materiality lenses from impact all the way through to financial statements so so when might we say, see the first srs you know srs1 sustainability reporting standard one well, it will be on climate, and it is pretty much feasible next year, 2022. Uh, is that going to be, as someone who bears the scars of long and drawn out uh, consultations on accounting standards, does that mean that that's when a, a, an exposure draft will be put out, which means it might be implemented, you know, one or two years after that? Or is that when you're pretty confident will it actually be something that, that's usable by the end of next year? So if you go at a very fast speed, what you can find is that the work that is going to be done, the pre-work, if you wish, building on the prototype climate standard, will be effectively the research phase of the standard setting process. It will have developed it to the point of an exposure draft. Of course, before it is formalized as an exposure draft, the new board, which let us say on the quickest scale, time scale, comes into existence in November and it starts working on it immediately, then it is ready to publish the exposure draft, um, say, early next year. Now, it does still need to give a proper consultation period, which is on the global arena, is at least three months. And then, of course, you need to conclude uh, having listened to stakeholder feedback. So a standard can be published next year, companies may want to start reporting, but will it be mandatory? 
from that stage? Well, no, I think you would probably uh, be looking to 2023 as the first period on which companies report. Okay, thanks. So, but, um, but, David but Jane, in the meantime, and right now, when companies are drawing up their balance sheet, their profit and loss, and their cash flow, they are under instruction, if they're using IFRS, that climate needs to be taken into account. So if you're valuing an asset, you're looking at an, a, a liability, you're thinking about what, how long an asset is likely to last for, for example, you've got a coal fire power station, the answer is you need to think about this, an oil well, so on. That is already now there very strongly in the guidance. And what, in addition, Veronica is saying is that there will be other things that investors would like to know about climate and indeed about a whole load of other things as well um, in the future, but uh, 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 starting with climate, um, um, for example, how you manage it, what the governance of it is and so on and so forth, that may be part of a narrative standard that everybody is going to, uh, is going to look to. But there are already now clear guidance under IFRS that when you draw up those numbers in the back end, the account, your profit and loss account, you need to have taken climate into account. Is, is that fair, Veronica? Absolutely, David. And I think there is also, we need to factor in the fact that we do have CCFD recommendations and many jurisdictions have moved to either mandate or recommend the reporting in line with TCFD on top of compliance with the existing standards that David is talking about. So we do have guidance and David actually, it was last week that FASB issued a sister publication if you wish to, is similar to what the ISB staff did. So there is educational material on how climate already manifests itself in the financial statements. TCFD complements it as a stepping stone, but the standard that we're going to see will allow us to have a consistent, robust, assurable framework against which companies report and, around and, that narrative that supports the numbers. I, that, that's right. And what, what Veronica and Janine are talking about is something that will start with climate, but there's lots of other things that uh, investors uh, will want to know about. Uh, workforce treatment, intellectual capital, all of, all of those sorts of things that I suspect don't naturally fall into the balance sheet and the profit and loss account. Actually, climate is one thing that absolutely does. We should not have assets that are valued in the balance sheet that are only valued that way because the world is going to be unsustainable. It, this needs to be done on the basis of I've considered climate, I've thought about sustainability, and I'm not valuing it at all well as though I'm taking oil out of it into the infinite future. Yeah, and, so you've got the accounting bit and you've got the narrative bit. And we've seen some very big impairments already now, haven't we, from the uh, fossil fuel uh, <laughs> companies on that basis. But Janine, um, perhaps you'd like to come in here and talk a bit about... Yeah, I just want to add something to something that David was saying about the narrative bit. I think what, the way to think about the narrative bit is it's both narrative and metrics. So, and and one of the some language we're starting to coalesce around is qualitative and quantitative. So you have what's in the what's in the financial statements today, what's captured in the financial statements today, and then you have this broader information set in order to really understand enterprise value of things that are not running through the financial statements. And that broader information set has both qualitative and quantitative aspects to it. It has narrative disclosures around governance, strategy, risk management. And it also has uh, quantitative information about targets and metrics. So a lot of what I think of as the metric oriented information in that space is what you know, management accountants may have historically called operational metrics. So what are the operational metrics that have historically been used internally to set KPIs or targets that now, because they are drivers of value, you know, could be reported externally. Obviously, when you start talking about climate, those are things like greenhouse gas emissions, but things like employee retention, um, you know, the composition of the workforce, those kind of measures, product packaging, uh, waste and product packaging, those kinds of things, which typically many, many companies now still manage and track internally. It's how does some of that information become tra more transparent to investors? And that's, um, I mean, um, I mean, Saspian from Dutch Nation, I think you've got more than 70 standards already, but they, I believe they're mostly sector-based. And I think what Veronica and actually you in that 
last few minutes have been talking about is actually very much cross-sectoral stuff. I mean, um, how you treat, how companies treat their workforce, um, including, you know, sort of human slavery at, um, at, at the extreme, um, that could happen in any sector. Um, it, most sectors have some sort of emissions, although, you know, those, those are the obvious cul culprits at the sort of uh, dirty coal end. Um, so how, how do you think you're the sort of um, SASB, IIRC, value reporting combination is going to make sure that you perhaps get stuff that's more principles based and cuts across sectors and not just sectoral? Yeah, so so with the way we laid out the document that Veronica referred to that has the prototype climate standard that we issued last December actually has two other very important pieces of content in it. One is we laid out a um, prototype conceptual framework that a sustainability standards board could use to govern standard setting. And then we laid out a prototype, what we called presentation standard, that could be a standard that could be used across multiple topics. And we laid out a common structure and that common structure always is qualitative discussion around governance strategy risk management and then disclosure of metrics and targets, and then the concept of cross-sectoral metrics and the concept of industry-specific metrics, and that both of those concepts are relevant. So we laid out that structure to really try to harmonize this conversation. What we're hearing is we are hearing increased investor demand for certain cross-sectoral metrics primarily around climate or human capital, but there's definitely not um, strong investor demand for you know, 30 or 40 cross-sectoral metrics. What, what we hear through SASB's investor network is a layer of cross-sectoral metrics on um, very pervasive topics and then very um, specific industry-specific disclosure on the topics that are most relevant to value creation in a specific yeah. industry. Sounds so, like a recipe yeah. for quite, some quite prescriptive guidance, actually. Um, <laughs> David, is this um, is this is this what you want? Is this what you want to see, or do you feel this is what users want to see, uh, as opposed to it becoming um, quite uh, preparer-led, um, detailed guidance? Yeah, I, 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 I think this is the right direction to be going in, Jane. The reason it's the right direction to be going in is because, look, in, in the shares of companies are held by pension funds representing millions and millions of people. It makes absolutely no sense for the intermediary investor not to know about the social performance of the companies that you're investing in and the things that uh, are not on the balance sheet and not on the profit and loss account. As I've said, there are some things that are not there yet and desperately need to be in the profit and loss account and the balance sheet, and climate is one of them. We need to get that in, but there's lots of other stuff that needs to be known as well. And if we're going to do this, there is just then the balance, isn't there? Because you want these measures to be comparable over time, and you want them to be comparable between companies. So you need to have some degree of rigor in how it is that you're collecting the numbers. On the other hand, we don't want this to be uh, so prescriptive that people will start hitting the target and missing the point. Most businesses trade in a way that it in general is, is you know, quite socially responsible in the way they do it. Of course, there are things that we learn about where they break the law, just we learn that people break the law and we learn about most of the time people are doing the right thing. And, and what we want is for companies to rigorously be reporting that they are doing that um, and where they're not being honest about it and why it is that they're not able to do it. And, and right now the alphabet soup is, has itself become a bit of a problem for that because how do I compare company X with company Y? Yeah. Uh, is it just that company Y looks bad because somebody decided they were going to have a campaign against them? I need to be able to compare them and I need to be a good adjudicator in all of this. So I thoroughly support all the stuff that Janine and uh, uh, Veronica are doing on the 
qualitative and quantitative information outside the accounts that, 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 that we need to have, because it's absolutely necessary if you're going to be a good investor mm -hmm. on behalf of all these, all these, these people's savings that pension yeah. funds and all the rest of it that you're going to manage. Um, but, but, it, but the balance between what's rigorous and what's just targets for targets sake. And what's greenwashing, you know, we mustn't, uh, we have to have that word in somewhere, that cautionary word in somewhere. Um, I just want to, uh, bring Veronica in because actually we're talking maybe a little bit as so, though um, the annual I mean there's lots of information but just take the annual report as if it's dominated by the financial statements actually the so-called front half of the annual report that I've been looking at for decades as well as the back half is now probably the front 66 percent um, because we've already got so much um, guidance and re regulation on so-called non-financial reporting, some of which, is, as you've all said, actually does have uh, is quite metric rich as it happens. So, Ver Veronica, where, where are we? You know, it's, so it's not just the back half. So, where are we at in terms of getting um, not just adding to this um, to, to the verbiage actually to, in the front half of the annual report? Well, and Jane, you pick one of the biggest challenges, right? So, because of course we need more information, but what we really need is the material information. We actually need to be able to tell the story about things that really matter. And I think there are two challenges here is that the alphabet soup wizard that we currently have, first of all, allows perhaps uh, for that story to be told in many different ways, such that it's not really comparable. That's what David is really talking about. So it really makes the analysis very difficult. But secondly, I think it's often used as an excuse for companies not to report on what really matters. And I think <laughs> that's also a bit of a problem. What I think is also a problem, which our regulator here in the UK has been focused on, is the fact that today we have very little discipline around the consistency between the front end and the claims and all the statements that companies make about their green credentials, ASG credentials or whatnot, and the information that is reported in the financial statements. So having that robust framework for reporting the right information, focusing on the right information in the front end on those broader ESG and sustainability matters is important. Having a connected approach to financial information is extremely important because that way you can call out the greenwash in the system, right? Because you can connect how those specific claims then translate into the judgments and estimates that are made in the financial statements. And that's important. That's absolutely critical. That's what David is talking about. He wants to understand how all of these assumptions about you know, the world of the future is going to affect the business model and therefore translate into the cash flow projections because that, that is where the real investment decision comes in. Mm -hmm. you know? I think to me, to me uh, having those standards, having that information will actually create the right discipline and hopefully allow to cut out all the noise and focus on what matters. So hopefully we don't grow bigger, but we grow in terms of the importance and reliability of that information. And of course, you know, that's where we also will finally have created a framework where we can provide the right degree of assurance. So we can start assuring against that framework. So it would it will help if some of if the proposals recent phase proposals um, uh, go through, which would um, mean that the auditor has to take an even closer look than they already do. I mean, some people think they've already got to look at the front half, make sure that the annual report as a whole give a, gives a true and fair view. But that could be tightened up. So presumably that would help. Well, standards always form the basis for the development of audit and assurance framework in the first mm -hmm. instance, right? So under ISO 720 today, auditors obviously do some work vis-a-vis -vis the information in the front end, but the real conversation will become once you have those standards, should you have a proper level of assurance moving perhaps from limited to reasonable assurance in due course on the information in that front end on those metrics that Jeanine was talking about that are so relevant to enterprise values that all the KPIs companies should be managing um, and will be reporting against. What discipline, what rigor do the boards have vis-a-vis -vis that information? Is it subject to the same internal control frameworks that you have for financial reporting? And is it subject to appropriate challenge and assurance? And that's where I think we will not only get the uh, uplift in the 
quality of that information that is provided in the front end, but I think we will also see an improvement in the quality of audits because it is so incredibly important to understand what, what really matters to a company today in order to do a good audit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Janine, was this anything you wanted to add at this point in terms of yeah, the other the oh. other challenge with the with the kind of well, we already have it in the front end of the report thinking is that 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 what that looks like varies around the world, right? So in the UK, you've got your strategic report, and the US, we've got the MDNA and the risk factors, and Europe, you've got the um, non financial reporting directive. So those structures vary around the world, which means that 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 does not result in comparable information for use by investors globally. The other issue in a US context is because so much of that information sits in MDNA and particularly risk factors, mm -hmm. um, it becomes very boilerplate. So what what you see or you see a long list of risk factors. And in fact, many of the issues in the SASB standards are in fact addressed as risk factors, but they're addressed with boilerplate um, information that does not provide any insight into the specific company performance or any metrics. So it's, it's really the need to standardize a lot of that information that may exist in um, outside of the financial statements today is what we're trying to achieve. Yeah, obviously risk important reporting is important. I suppose I mean that's that's sort of first base, isn't it? Getting um, you know, David getting uh risks uh, a really good, not just a, a um a good entity specific list of risks, but also to have it prioritized and you know, mitigating factors. I, I think that's right, Jane. And 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 I think as well the 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 point you made about the front end, the front end and the back end are 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 one whole of the annual report, and and it, it an in, an intriguing thing, and this is actually it's for Veronica's company that did this. It was one big European oil company that was making big statements about uh, how it was going to be net zero and Paris compliance and all the rest of it. And Deloitte, uh, in the their key audit matters. A, a explained, look, they're saying that in the front end of the report, in the back end of the report, they're using assumptions that it would be difficult to reconcile with a, a Paris. And that self same company, absolutely to their credit, came back in the second quarter, revalued their assets with a big announcement about their capital expenditure and they're going to cut back on their capital expenditure because it didn't look sensible if you weren't uh, using those sorts of assumptions. That's exactly the sort of process that we're wanting, isn't it? Where the front end and the back end beautifully dovetail together so that we are able to see that companies are trading in a way that is sustainable financially. That's critical that they're sustainable financially. So we're, they're making a return on their capital, but they're not doing that by, by a, a, a making sure that costs are falling on the rest of society. And actually, if you can get that right interpretation on the way the accounts are done on the back end, and then these sorts of interpretations on the front end, both qualitative and quantitative, we are moving towards a better place. And for me, the climate is the emergency. And then but we've got all the other things that we want to, yeah. that we need to know about over the coming years. Yeah, now we're obviously coming to the end of the session. Um, and so you'll have to try to be brief and just in, as we just wrap up. In five years time, what sort of sustainability report, reporting framework are we going to have or what would success look like? So perhaps Janine, you'd like to go first on that. Well, I think success would definitely look like we have established the enterprise value disclosure block under the IFRS foundation and that that is widely used as uh, the foundational level of disclosure by companies to their investors around the world. Um, and that has then significantly improved the quality of the conversation and the analytics about how um, sustainability issues impact long-term enterprise value. And that then results in changes in decision-making by both investors and companies. So that's what I would hope we could accomplish in five years. And Veronica. Just building on what Janine said, I think a consistent, comparable, reliable baseline data around the world 
focused on the ESG issues that are relevant to enterprise value creation. That's the first thing. The second thing, companies themselves treating that data as important as the financial data, therefore exercising integrated thinking and integrated approach within how they manage that information in the business. So that by that, I mean really SOC style discipline around the internal controls, the shareability of the data, the board level ownership of that information. So I think very much consistent with what Janine was just describing. Yeah, and, and David, um, and so would investors in that case have all that they need to uh, assess? Well, and, uh, people, people will always ask for more, Jane. And, and actually, if, if I had a goal in five years, I, I think I might almost narrow it down just to climate and talk about outcomes rather than processes. Because I think if we do this right, we're saying to companies, when you report to us, your profitability and your solvency, you've taken climate into account, and investors have asked that the assumptions that you're making are consistent with sustainability. And if you do that in five years time, we will not have quoted companies that are profiting by valuing assets uh, well above what they can do in a sustainable world. In other words, they are trading sustainably as regards climate and will have achieved that by making sure that accounting numbers are done right and that front end reporting is done right. And by the way, investors and regulators need to be there absolutely insisting that these things are done. And so the accounting numbers and the SSB numbers and the other numbers, they come together to create for climate, which is the emergency sustainable companies, which is of course what we all want to be investing in. Yeah. Well, this has all been rather, um, well, not just idealistic actually. I think I do have a much better understanding of how, how this might actually happen in practice. So um, it's been a pleasure talking to you all and uh, thank you very much for, for your time and your wisdom. And you, Jane. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.